Frank said that the amazing thing about Lucian was that when anybody, including himself or me, would have thought it was finished, Lucian would say, it isn't, and it wasn't. And Lucian would go one further. Um, and when a painting works, it's that it looks as though there's been nothing quite like, quite like it before. And I think we all aspire to doing things that haven't been quite like it. following is a conversation with William Fever. William is an art critic, curator, lecturer and an artist himself. From 1975 to 1998, he was a chief art critic for The Observer. In 2019, he published the first volume of a two-part biography on Lucian Freud. It was through reading this book that I was first introduced to William's work. Freud is regarded by many as one of the most significant artists of the 20th century. William's account of his life is honest, insightful and a great read. On the podcast, we discuss the life and work of Lucien Freud, as well as his contemporaries. If you like this conversation, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, or follow me on Instagram at Recorded Time Podcast. I hope you enjoy the episode. Yeah, sending this one out to my man, Killer B. It's a bit too neat to draw comparisons between Lucian Freud and his grandfather. But do you think it's a coincidence that arguably the most famous psychologist of all time had a grandson who would prove to be one of the greatest psychological painters of the 20th century? I think it's neat and and true enough. Um, But to say that um, Lucian got a a head start because of his famous surname is, is true, I think. And also there's a a definite correlation between um, the achievements of the grandfather, which were titanic and actually in a way more famous in the days in the late 1930s to the 1950s, more famous than he is today possibly. Um, And um, Lucian couldn't but grow up conscious that there was this great name hanging around his neck and it um, affected his work, but not in the sense of being literal, not in the sense of um, actually sort of... um, doing paintings in the spirit of works of Sigmund Freud. But do you think it was something in the family then, just this preoccupation with uh, human psychology? Well, I think the interesting thing about it is that um, in the 1930s, when Lucien, as a very small grandson, knew his grandfather, in those days, um, it was thought that the Freud thesis or theses were a kind of of, of, um, 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 scientific explanation for the way people behave and the the, the way that people's mental makeup is made. And I think latterly, um, in the last 20 so years, 30 years perhaps, um, Freud, Sigmund Freud has become famous for more or less being in the sort of impresario of of mental uh, awareness, psychological awareness, and that sort of stagecraft, the the, the 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 drama of you know lying on the couch not seeing your interrogator, um, the interrogator absorbing the information, um, a, a sort of picture of the person's psyche being being built up and expressed, all that um, is something which has developed as the one thing that Sigmund Freud can't be disputed against. He he achieved that, and of course um, Lucian. Um, was building up his practice, um, just as this change in attitudes towards Sigmund Freud were developing, I think, pretty well universally. Right. Did, well, at the time in the 1930s, then, did, do you think Lucian, I mean, obviously, artists probably more than any other occupation are known for their egos. Do you think Lucian almost felt like he had to try and step outside the shadow of his grandfather then? Was he, did he shy away from his relationship with Sigmund or was it something that he uh, bragged about? 
Well, um, in 1938, um, he was going, Lucy was going down Regent Street, part of London, and there was somebody manning a store which had um, demands for um, uh, signatures for people protesting against um, what, everything that was going wrong, basically, in um, Europe at the time. And Lucien signed it. Um, the folk behind the desk uh, didn't sort of uh, take any notice of it. He just um, sort of said, thank you. And Lucien was sort of dismissed. But so Lucien said, well, if you like, I'll get my grandfather's signature. And the man, of course, didn't blench a hair, didn't even recognize that. So clearly Lucien was keen to um, be the person who could wave his grandfather as a kind of um, an entree to um, well, all kinds of society. I mean, um, he, he, uh, bureaucratic society, um, political society, um, emotional society, um, and, and above all, of course, artistic society. In 1938, how old would he have been when that, when that happened? He was um, for, for 14, 15. 14, 15. So he was pretty young, because, but he'd left school. He was about to become a, a, an art student. And, um, he'd, and he left Berlin in what year? He left um, Bramston in 1938. 1938. No, oh, sorry, left Berlin in, in what year? Well, in, in, sorry, in, in 1933. Um, Hitler came to power at the beginning of 1933, and um, it, the, the, the Freud family, that is to say, um, his son, um, Lucien's father, um, Lucien's two brothers and mother, um, left Berlin in the, in the autumn of 33. Uh, 33. And so Lucy was only about eight at the time, and um, it was quite a uh, quite a, a, an up, uprooting um, and very well timed. Do you reckon he absorbed much of what he saw in Berlin? Because I know you say in the book that there was um, he he vaguely remembers being uh, whether he was invited to or whether there was a um, a Hitler youth meeting at his school, and that he he that was the first he heard of Hitler. Yes, I mean, it, it, Lucien's stories of rebellion, which usually turned out to be pretty accurate, I managed to check them against a, 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 a girlfriend, same age as him um, at the time. The, the problem that the family faced was what, what, what to do, and this applied to, of course, at presumably every Jewish family in Berlin, and the ability to move internationally was all the better for Sigmund Freud, I think, that, that you know, this, this name got them passports, this name got them um, uh, a leg start. But um, Lucien's awareness of, of um, anti-Semitism, persecution, all the, all the things getting worse, was, was pretty vague. Um, he saw the Hitler Youth as, a, as, a, as an organisation which is basically devoted to campfires and cooking sausages. Uh, um, and um, that's teachers said strange things to him like that um that Lucien wasn't um to consider himself to be one of the one of the class um that he was something outside and not only was he not not working class either um and act middle class um he was um someone who could um fend for himself there, there were various suggestions which cropped up in daily life which gradually impinged on him um but impinged far more upon his mother who was sort of shocked when Lucien saw swastikas chalked on the wall and started chalking more swastikas himself. I mean, he, he was just a little boy. Um, and, and the awareness of what was later to happen was, was a, a completely different matter, of course. But do you think any of the war um, or the... Do you think the war is in his work at all, even in like his, his earlier works? Is there a... Is there a horrible um, atmosphere in some of the earlier paintings? Well, there's a drawing I found which is which shows um, hundreds and hundreds of, of bombed houses um, in North London, the north, part of North London where he lived, um, and it's a kind of view of a, a sort of a, a naughty town, a toy town. It's not a horrors of war um, drawing at all. Um, it looks had scary, very scary ad adventures on a transatlantic convoy, um, he sort of ran away to sea at the age of 18 and, um, and did not fit in as an as, as a emergency auxiliary sailor. Um, but apart from a bit of bombing, shortages, getting by, um, Lucien was very unscathed by the war really. Um, and as in the rest of his life, um, it was his life 
and not a life of huge social participation. I mean, for example, he refused to um, have his name registered as an as a owner occupier of, a, of a, any building because that might mean he was going to be uh, checked up on by the police and um, get into trouble for all sorts of traffic infringements. I mean, his life got very complicated, um, but I don't think you can say the war um, um, disturbed him all that greatly. Well, how, how involved was, uh, it was the Bell Trover, wasn't it, the Merchant Navy ship that he was on? Yes. Uh, how involved was that ship in uh, the war over the Channel? Um, or not at all? It was... It was it, it, it's, it was from Liverpool to um, New Brunswick, um, and it was sent over to um, pick up um, lumberjacks and timber as a mixed cargo. Um, it saw action in that um, a tanker was blown, blown up, a tanker that's destined for um, Gibraltar was blown up um, within sight, and this was terribly shocking. Um, when he got to um, Halifax, um, the uh, rather bright-eyed um, uh, shore official wondered why um, this young man had got a, a British passport dated 1939, um, when uh, that was the year in which, due to influence, um, pulling strings, the Freud family um, got their passports. Sigmund Freud already got his. He'd been welcomed to England with open arms as a great sort of cultural beacon. But the, um, the Lucius family um, hadn't got passports. And so to have one made of, of, a, of a German born person dated 1939 was considered to be deeply suspicious. And Lucius was briefly taken into custody. Then it was explained that the royal family had intervened on his behalf, his parents' behalf. So Lucian had this mixture, strange mixture of being um, refugee status, um, a, 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 a boy of, of sort of great determination, but um, rather harebrained schemes. And on the other hand, um, it, the immense privilege that a cultural name attached to him. And so almost the best of both worlds, despite war. It's quite interesting then I hadn't even, because I hadn't made the connection between the royal family helping him come as a refugee uh, to England. And then of course he paints the Queen's portrait uh, 60 or 70 years later in 2002. And that sort of just almost, <laughs> that, changes the context a bit of that, uh, that it does relationship. Change the context, yes, um, and, and he, he said, he always said, and this I think was very genuine, was that um, he, he owed his life, his family's, his family survival um, to the, uh, the Duke of York, I, th I think, that um, intervened. Um, it wasn't um, uh, George VI. Um, and this, uh, I suppose, is, is admirable that he um, did, besides liking the idea of um, painting the Queen, um, it, it meant that um, it, it was a rescue, it was a, a, a tolerance, it was um, what made Lucian's uh, 80 or so years later on um, a, a great life in London. London was his great loyalty, I think, rather than England. Um, but he was, um, I suppose, uh, constantly, constantly aware of this, and, and his brothers too, to some extent. To be considered the greatest artist in the world, or at least to be in the conversation, do you, do you think one has to be the greatest portraitist, greatest painter of the nude, and greatest overall draftsman? Oh, God. Um, I, I think that's all arguable and debatable. Um, but I think when you're in your studio by yourself or with maybe um, just the odd visitor, you don't really think, uh, am I number one or number two, or possibly disaster is number three. I think it's, mm. I think um, all of us trying to paint or trying to make any work of art, we all um, think of that as the immediate concern. Mm. I think, um, I think to, to, to erect a, a pecking order is, um, well, at the best is a kind of parlor game. <laughs> I just I only say that because that criteria seems, uh, for the most part, to have sort of determined uh, who we revere as uh, the greatest artist. But well, Julius, um, I think I think you you you're, you're sniffing around the footsteps of the um, auction houses as much as the dealers. You think? Yep. <laughs> that was another another priority list, which that yes. possibly is the one who's number one. Um, 
Lucian, of course, loved protecting his corner, but I don't think he thought as he woke up in the morning that uh, I'm maybe number one or two or three in, in the pecking order. Um, fame is, is or was a very peculiar thing. Was when I first knew him, um, he, he was known, but not, not that well known and certainly not universally known. And indeed, when I organized this Tate Britain exhibition um, in 2002, which took about sort of five years to, to, to do. Um, it, it was the Tate's view rather that um, this was a, a minor concession to old fashioned taste. And that when the queues formed, um, they said this would cause a severe blockage here and you know, we mustn't have queues. And Lucien said, well, I want queues around the block. I mean, that's, he, he liked fame, he liked that, as long as his fame wasn't intrusive on his privacy. He's much more fanatic about his privacy than he wants for about being famous or being number one, two, three, four, five, or six. Mm. Well, Lucian was considered sort of a bit of a dinosaur for the majority, well, until probably like the latter half of his life, wasn't he? Um, mm -hmm. And partly because he was a figurative painter, partly because he was a representational painter. But do you think representational painting is uh, more timeless than many critics say it is? Because I, I feel that part of the problem with the trajectory of art in the last hundred years is that it seems to sort of insist on a um, progression of formal stylistic genres uh, and I think this insistence sort of discourages people from pushing representational painting further and figurative painting especially and I think Freud and Bacon and Auerbach sort of defy that trend. I think I think any any Anybody who was a painter, well, of course, in the early 1970s, when I started sort of being operating, um, any, anything that was to do with paint was got as dodgy, suspect, and possibly elitist, and certainly, certainly exclusive, or old hat, just, you know, stuff from the past. Um, I, one thing that really um, bore in on me um, when I started, first started um, being no longer a semi-painter, but more a, a, a semi-writer, and then a, a full-time writer was the idea that any kind of art um, is somehow um, a, a series of sort of leapfrog activities. You, you leap over the back of the previous genre or, or, or preoccupation. And in the early 70s, the preoccupation was um, oh, Joseph Boyce and um, artist spirituality um, digging holes in the landscape um, rather than creating sort of vertical sculptures. Um, an awful lot more talk than practice, perhaps. Uh, we, we all know all these things. They were, and, they, and they were sort of fine in their way. They were experimentation and um, some of it because cliche experimentation. But um, to come across, as I did for the first time, pictures by Lucien in various houses, and he was showing me around some of the addresses in London where he had paintings lodged. Um, it was exciting because it seemed to me the, 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 the corniest, the most basic, um, things that paintings were about, which is um, the human figure, animals, places, um, records of things. Um, these paintings of Lucian's were as fresh and as arresting and in the context of the early 1970s, um, completely um, alien to the more, much more fashionable quests for um, you know, the significance of um, planting lightning conductors in um, Texan fields. And um, that sort of thing was, um, the standard um, art politics, I suppose, at the time. And actually, I, did, I then came to realize, and I think this is largely, largely through knowing Mark Andrews and Lucien and, and, and Frank Arbach, that every generation has to re-equip um, with fresh work, almost like doing performances um, that the painter, and I'm primarily interested in painting and being a painter, the painter, and I'm sure you, you find this too, every new work is something new and fresh, and it may even be in the style or reflection of the past, it builds on the past, it jumps from the past, and unless we have the continuity of a lot of artists, um, whatever their genre, um, continuing and, and pressing away what they are doing is actually reporting on their own age, their own lifetime, their own lifespan. And um, Lucien did this marvellously, that he stuck to um, the room in which he was painting, not a lavishly appointed studio ever. Um, the people he was 
choosing to paint, people he had some sort of emotional engagement with or intellectual engagement with, and the fact that um, it, art is so slow and so um, tiny. You know, Lucian's paintings, a few hundred paintings from a lifetime. Um, these works are kind of pebbles thrown into the sea and they, they, they are either skip like um, a, a Barnes Wallace experimental um, uh, thrown stone, or they disappear out of sight altogether. But the job of the artist is to actually do it, um, regardless of style, content, or even approach and attitude, I think. But so you feel that Freud's subject matter is almost traditional in one sense, but he depicts it in a... Because, I mean, you look... He, I always feel that he could have existed in uh, any other century, even with the subject matter that he chose. But there's a originality with which he paints it that is very distinct of the 20th century. And how do you think he... Yes. reconciled those two contradictions? I think he did. Um, I think it's quite, quite amazing is that, um, you know, uh, let's see, um, Bruce Nauman, perfectly respectable, good pre performing and uh, an artist working in neon and all sorts of materials and all sorts of attitudes. Right, he's got a corpus of work, which is could be catalogued, catalogue raisonné um, for a lifetime, and put that against what Lucian did. And actually, the accomplishment in, in intelligence, the achievement, um, well, both have some, um, but the paintings were so rigorously edited and destroyed that they didn't come up to scratch and um, so um, relentless in their way. Um, Lucian's um, had many um, diversions, including the horses and girlfriends and so on. Despite that, the, the center of his life, the, the point of his life was to paint. And that applies, has always applied, I think, to every single painter of any note and seriousness existence. The work counts, the work is, the, is expresses the life. And it's no wonder, perhaps, therefore, that um, everything that Lucian did and survived, that he didn't you know, slit and, and chuck out, um, everything that passed his sort of quality control test is significant. And, and that is just as fresh today as it was in the times of, um, well, I don't know, Constable, um, our mutually favorite painter, um, Monet, Kobe, Coro, um, any, any painters of the past one cares to think of. And it's one of the great things about art, I think, is that every generation renews it. And without performing art, um, you know, doing, making things, our connections with the past aren't nearly as strong as they would be if it's just archeology span we were looking back at. What percentage of Freud's works did he destroy? It varied, but um, there were paintings, some paintings that started off and went okay and would occupy months, and some just went wrong for all sorts of reasons, but the worst reason of all was anything to do with slickness or um, sort of pre preconditioned. Um, he, at one stage, he, when the painter, American, sort of London American painter, uh, uh, Ron Kitai, um, his wife died and um, he accused um, the critics of their destructive writing having killed her, uh, having a brain aneurysm, poor woman. Um, and Lucian thought the only way of cheering up Ron was to um, offer to paint him, which he did. And Ron then infuriated him by trying to have a look at the picture, a sly look at the picture at every stage, um, you know, every, every um, session. And the painting just did not come right, and I saw it, you know, occasionally. Um, and this larger-than-life character had been shrunk to a kind of puppet head, and it just didn't work, and that got um, slashed um, and destroyed. Um, a, a bit of it survives, and I think it could be, is exhibitable for historical reasons. But um, but Lucian, um, you know, dozens at a time would, would be, be wrecked. And there is a kind of satisfaction, I'm sure you recognise this, that... Um, You've worked, worked and worked and worked on something and you put everything into it and think it's going to be good or it's going to do something and then you realize it's not so the, 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 the gesture of smashing it is um it's something you screw yourself up to and afterwards you feel much better um, mm. it's great relief isn't it and and the desire to edit things down to just the, the, the passable the good is something that every, we, we should all do much more of, I think, mostly there's too much bad art around. Have a, um, have a tighter filter on, on the work we produce. 
Yes, and not and not leave a great heap of of um, unachieved things um, or, or unsatisfactory things. It's yeah. it's a very salutary thing to do, I think. And certainly, Lucian taught me that that um, to be ruthless. Um, but when you're in the hot frenzy of actually at work and um, moving the paint around, that's one thing. But afterwards, in the cold light of dawn, you should say that's no good. And, mm. and of course, one is invariably right because the thing is destroyed. You don't regret. Mm. And you see that with all the great masters, Michelangelo, Leonardo, just destroying hundreds and hundreds of drawings right up to their death. Well, yes, I mean, Leonardo's drawings were uh, were just um, notebook scribbles. And, and of course, my God, what scribbles. Um, uh, Marvellous. And, and of course, we, and we, we feast in them. But the odd dodgy Leonardo quotes, what could be Leonardo, the world can do without, um, I think. We, we well, that's... No picture. that's that's the thing about I've always the thing about the great masters and what seems to make them so unapproachable isn't just their achievements, but the complete absence of a single mistake in any of their work. Well, of course, mis mistakes can be turned to advantage, can't they? They can be happy accidents, and and they can be the thing that surprises you. Um, I think this certainly applies with Frank Auerbach, who paints and repaints and repaints session after session with the same sitters year after year, which I'm I'm one, and that the paintings um, always have to go back to scratch after each session. It's so, it's so in Frank's case, that he's, he's an actor, an actor Monke, um, giving a performance to himself. And it's most likely that something which looks good at first sight then has to be wiped. And so he wipes them. Now, Lucien was a more, um, more a man of a, a swordsman, more of a, a kicker and a slasher, um, um, but, for both of them, the work that comes to completion or satisfac a fast satisfactory state or a surprising state that remains satisfactory, mm. um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing quite like, I think, an actor taking over a role and um, performing it live every night. And recordings of any kind are fine, interesting, but they're not quite the same as doing it every night. And that's what um, we painters should be doing. Um, but um, we're... Was Albach and Freud's approach in that sense very different to Bacon's? Because you get the sense from Bacon's work that it's been done in one go. And he, whether it's uh, true or not, he's certainly, you know, he's famous for conveying that sense of the accident as it's just been done in one, one flurry of a brush. So did Bacon work uh, at the same prolonged uh, time, time span that Albach and Freud did? I think all, all, all three pretty different. Um, Bacon was at his best, I think, in the, in the 1950s and early 60s, when um, the happy accidents of the, the swipe, the, the, the blotch, the um, sense of sort of horror or excitement um, all got mixed up in a most eloquent way. But as soon as it became a mannerism, that's a bit dodgy. And then not only became a mannerism, but he took to talking about, about one of my more important paintings, or indeed triptychs. Um, the things multiplied and they got, I think, more and more vacuous. Mm -hmm. um, but um, one thing that Lucien always insisted on is that if you've managed to do one or two good paintings in a lifetime, that's okay. That's that you can be, um, you know, it was worth it. Remembered for that. Mm. <laughs> so, um, you know, one's got to um, cut. And his, his most strong complaint about um, late Bacon was that um, Bacon was, you know, they were in huge gilt frames. They were regarded as incredibly important, the triptychs particularly, when actually um, they were um, Bacon product and rather than Bacon, Bacon creation, I think. So sorry. Uh, and Freud that doesn't stop Bacon being, having been a great artist in his, in his period. But so sorry, um, Freud resented them being in gilded frames behind glass, did he, or? He didn't resent, resent, resent it so much as, as um, think that it was preposterous that Bacon was sort of um, uh, going along with the, with, the, with the market in a way. Um, you know, the, the bigger the painting, the better, it mm. was assumed. The bigger the gilt frame, the more it was a kind of coronation ceremony to finish a picture. And, kind of, and it got a bit pompous enough itself, basically. I, kind of, I was reading uh, Keith Richards' bio autobiography a few years ago, and there's this passage where he's disgusted when Mick Jagger takes the knighthood uh, when he gets yes. knighted by the Queen. So 
reminds me well, of that. Well, of course, Lucian took up things. Um, he didn't become a sir. That's one thing he avoided. He became an OM, which is rather grand and discreet, and he liked that. Um, but then, as I, as I was saying, um, he's the refugee from uh, emigre from Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. um, didn't go. Didn't get shipped abroad, uh, abroad to Australia as an enemy alien, as has happened. And of course, ships got sunk, and he kept in London. And London for him. London was the place for him. I don't know if it was the same for you, but when I was younger and particularly before Freud's death, I used to think of his work as uh, quite cold, cold in subject matter, uh, cold in its uh, brutal honesty. But since his death, um, at least to me, his work has seemed more and more sympathetic or compassionate. And more and more, I get the sense that he really cared about his uh, subjects. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. I mean, for example, can I just show a few, a few pictures? Um, here's um, early work. It's surrealistic, you might say. Um, mm -hmm. It's the genuine stuffed Deborah's head, as one gets out <laughs> one studio, mm -hmm. and it's done in meticulous schoolboy detail. And then a generation later, there's Lucian um, in um, his studio, looking down at the mirror lying on the floor, painting from that, producing this extraordinary image of with the sort of the halo of the, mm. the, the light bulb, and two of his children um, uh, up for scale. I've, I've never, I've never quite and, understood um, the. Paintings, uh, I've never quite understood the composition in that last painting, that one you've, the, the second one you picked up. I've never quite understood yeah. the, how how the children relate to the composition, because well, th they, th this is uh, my myth um, gets overtaken by reality. Um, I found the photographs, the snapshots that that um, these came, the children came from, and I, actually, as you look at it, you can see it, it is a, a record of a snapshot, rather like a bacon in in, in some respects. But the the reflection um, of a self portrait. Um, it's always difficult because um, you know, you're, you're looking at yourself in the mirror and that's a kind of a weirdly disturbing and an irritating thing. And he thought putting the mirror on the floor and so it was staring up at him. Uh, would give right. It literally another angle. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a bit cranky, I think. I, I, I would put in this picture, which of course everybody can love. It's a picture of buttercups in the mm. four color. Um, just to be able to do a flower piece that you don't think is um, kitsch or, 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 or just a botanical illustration. And it's actually got everything about the, the beauty of, of um, flowers and, and the importance of flowers. And you know, I, I could bang on about the centrality of um, you know, fungi and trees, and we're all into that now. Mm. Lucian did it by just painting um, cut, um, cut flowers in a sink in his studio. Um, you can make the universal out of something so local, so tiny that um, it hardly counts as anything except a kind of um, um, prompt, I suppose. Well, I've always thought Dürer's uh, work is probably, I mean, if his style is, if Freud's style is closest to anyone's, I've always thought it's closest to Dürer's. And that's, you know, those uh, yes. botanical paintings by Dürer sort of remind me of those buttercups. Yes, and... it's Duro rather than Leonardo, isn't it? I think, mm. yes. Um, yeah. It's, it's also very much northern. Um, Lucien loved Titian above perhaps almost everybody and, and then Rembrandt, of course, uh, you know, the obvious. But um, when he came to choosing some pictures from the National Gallery in London for um, an, an, a, a series of exhibitions of artists choosing their favourite pictures from the, um, from the gallery, he was really exercised about it. Um, it was like solving a great crossword puzzle, I think. And one night he rang up and he said that um, what he'd found was very strange, which was that it was Northern Europe he liked, not Southern Europe, not, not Italy, setting aside Titian. Um, uh, he found, I think, great, much more sympathy in, in, in particularly the Netherlands, I suppose, and in French painting, of course, um, than anywhere else. And so this, you know, this emigrant, immigrant, um, refugee almost, um, picked up what he liked, but actually he was rooted in London and that latitude. Hmm. Well, my sense has always been that the great artists are often more, even more aesthetically articulate um, than even some of the greatest art writers. Um, I mean, in the Bacon and Sylvester interviews, you never get the sense that Sylvester understands art more deeply than Bacon does. 
was that the same for Freud? Do you think? Because I, I, I just feel there's more, there's less interviews of Freud out there than there are of Bacon, and so I'm sort of. There are very few, and I, I did I did a, a number, um, three or four. In, 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 I was writing uh, art critic in the Observer, the London Observer at the time, um, and Martin Gayford sat for him and produced a very nice book um, of sort of memories of sitting. But Lucian now, and, and Lucian did actually, um, David Sylvester helped him on a, something which became his statement in the, in the um, 19, early 1950s. Um, but on the whole, he thought Sylph, as he called him, was, a, was a, bit of a, a, a bit of a joke because he would agree with whatever the last person he talked to had said to him. <laughs> that, was talking of, that was talking about Martin Gayford. No, that's not right. So, David Sylvester, Martin Gayford. Um, oh, talking about Sylvester. Sorry. Yes, a great, an enormous. You might say mountainous difference yeah. between them. Um, actually, in the end, for somebody who was reticent, Lucian gave an awful lot of um, interviews and things. And, and um, with Jay Carvark, Frank Carvark's son, I did a, a, a film of um, Lucian Sitters, and um, Lucian avoided appearing in these these things but actually in the end um what his sitters thought of him became a kind of portrait of him and um on the yeah sorry i was just going to say how many hours did you spend uh recording and interviewing him oh um i wrote uh, this colossal um hefty um lump of a book this is volume one only <laughs> um it's an enormous book came out of something like 25 years of work, planning, working and writing. Um, we began when I was asked to do a, a, a short monograph, um, which I, I eventually I did do, but um, Lucien got more and more used to me bringing a black box, as he called it, along to record him and got very happy with that. Then he freaked at the amount he talked and he thought it was talking drivel and um, he, he was actually a, a marvellous talker, I think, um, and very, very funny and very perceptive. And we agreed that the book I was writing would um, be um, a novel published after he died. In other words, this, this, let him off the, this let him off the hook of being a kind of mistaken for someone who actually liked the sound of his own voice. And he actually was acutely embarrassed by his German accent. And... <laughs> good, good impression. He, he, oh, yes, <laughs> You had enough time to perfect it, I guess. Impressionist. Um, he, he was really um, taken aback by this, what look, would look like gross e egocentricity, he thought. But of course, actually, biography isn't egocentricity. It's actually a portrait of. Um, and, and so by the um, time he died um, in 2011, um, I'd been talking to him on the phone for most days of the week for, um, well, uh, well over 10 years and um, because we were on the phone and I didn't have his number ever and I never therefore called him except in emergencies when I went through his secretary. Um, Lucien um, was actually um, stoking the conversation all the time. Hello William, how, 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 how goes it? He'd say or hello William, how old am I now? And so although he'd stopped the biography. Um, how old in the book did he mean? He, he, he meant he, he would go on talking and then he'd refer people to me saying I knew more about him as his memory started to fade. And um, so it was a very, rather complicated and, and entangled relationship. And I could only write the book after his death, though, because um, obviously there were um, patterns in his life which um, uh, had to sort of um, disentangle somewhat. Did you find, would, um, did you find that... Did you find you could write about him more honestly and about his life more honestly in his absence after he'd died? Yes, I think so, because um, such things as hurt feelings or, um, and um, it would have been um, a sort of parroting thing to do if I'd been the parrot and just repeated the things he said. And, um, and I w wanted to be able to talk to people who he, who he was got on best with and, and people who disliked him greatly. Um, but on the whole, he was a, a generous spirit with, with one or two younger artists. Um, he helped them along. 
He was generous financially. He's also incredibly demanding. Um, and my my role, having stopped being a professional art critic and you know, being defrocked from that position, um, I was free to operate. I, I I thought that he was the most extraordinary person, and um, that unless something with his voice in it and his attitudes in it and his his ambitions in it and his um, wit as well, unless that was on on on, on full record, it would be rather like. Vincent van Gogh, um, with or without letters to his brother. Um, the letters to his brother are invaluable and, and, and are largely responsible for van Gogh's great fame and endurance, I think, um, over the centuries or so since he died. So um, I was sort of um, painting, a, doing a drawing or writing a portrait of Lucien, not in his presence, but with his voice echoing all the time. Is there something different about, I mean, is it strange being in such close proximity to such an artistic genius or did you know him so well that it was kind of his, his genius was kind of irrelevant to your relationship with him? Yeah, I think, um, I, I don't think I'd regard him as genius at all. Um, my, so my daughter, a couple of my daughters um, took a fa such a fancy, such a love to for his whippet. Um, that Pluto, um, who was a, a bitch, not not a, not a male, <laughs> and so that's one of those little 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 details that need clearing up. Um, they they would uh, um, go to his fridge, Lucian's fridge, when they arrived, to find the, knowing they'd find the best and most exclusively fine um, mince steak um, from uh, Lydgate's in St Holland Park poshest um, butchers you can you can in in the in, in Europe I should imagine and Lucien would give it to the dog by just chucking a, a handful onto the floor and they the daughters would be uh, proclaim themselves being astonished by his his complete disregard for um, poor Pluto's um, sort of wishes and so on uh, the, it was a kind of ritual that, that, that was performed whenever they saw him and Lucien's way of talking to them was to um, sort of um, get, get to that level very nice and, and without um, being too sort of avuncular. Um, as so it was a, a personal collection and um, it was, I wouldn't say affectionate, but it was, it was kindly. And I never regarded him as best friend, but I certainly regarded him as a friend. And it was a great relief to me after years of doing columns in which I was castigating stuff and, and being lofty and a sort of taxi driver for um, the art world that I was sort of free to be make my own independent relationships with people and and um, Lucy and, 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 and Frank Harvard and Michael Andrews of this group which has been dubbed the School of London mainly because they painted in London and were friends um, gradually it gradually became established in public view um, while I was myself um, getting to know them better as time went on. How did, how did um, you first meet Freud? I was um, living in the north of England in Newcastle and I um, got on to writing for the Sunday Times magazine, which in the 1970s was a, a really big, big, big deal. Um, you know, newspapers are still making profit. Um, Colour mag magazines were you know, a novelty. And they wanted to do a great splash about this almost unknown Lucian Freud. Somebody else started writing an article, but asked too many awkward questions, Lucian claimed, so he put a stop to that. And I was brought in as a complete naive from Newcastle, um, who hadn't, wouldn't be tainted by London sophistication <laughs> and so on. And, um, and the, the friendship developed by, 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 by rather faltering degrees and then, and then got underway within a few years. Um, did he did he did he warm to you um, more than other critics and writers because you were also a painter? He liked that, yes, and he was very very kind coming to my ex exhibitions and um, and not blowing up, but saying, "Oh, that's the landscape you could walk around in." That's that was praise. Um, um, it's excruciating for me to see my things and have him. Um, direct his rather sort of magnetic eyes onto them. 
but um, no, he was, he was very nice about it. And, um, and I think if one's talking about painting, it's probably it should be compulsory that you should, you should do it yourself as well. Because um, I know that of course, some painters have become good writers. I mean, there, there are, um, it, it can be the other way around. Because I was watching that documentary, uh, Lucian Freud, A Painted Life. And I think uh, David Dawson talks about how uh, Freud warmed to him because he was a painter himself. And so oh, yes, that's... absolutely. And, um, and it meant that he was um, always got his mind half on something else that he was doing. Um, yes, David. Um, you know, a mile or so away in his where he lived, and it's yeah. I think it's essential. I, I think I think actors are probably the best judges of actors on the whole, and theatre critics are. I would imagine um, actors Monquet. Um, uh, I think I think the the roles. One's juggling the two or three roles if one's writing and um, doing the, the art itself or trying to do the art itself. Um, Lucian was not susceptible to blah, blah, blah about his work. Um, and he, he, liked, um, he liked one to, to point at a bit of a painting on, in progress and just grunt and want to know what was meant that was not quite it. And um, that's the thing, sort of thing that I think painter to painter is possible. Um, but it'd be very presumptuous of me to um, put myself up alongside him, of course. But, but you, but you're clearly accomplished enough to at least engage in a dialogue about art on the same level, whether you can paint as well as him or not. Yes, of course, and I, I, I wouldn't, in my pretty, pretty generally speaking, I wouldn't wouldn't confuse my work with his. <laughs> um, but with with Frank Auerbach um, again sitting because he he I'm I'm, I'm a Monday night sitter until the pandemic. Put a stop to us being sitting sitters. Mm. There's five of us: um, a wife, son, um, uh, Catherine Lambert, and David Landau, and myself. Um, and we've been his uh, week in, week out, evening exercise, really, or daytime exercise. And um, it's good to see the awfulness of, of paintings, paintings going wrong and going off track. And then maybe suddenly coming right, and when they suddenly come right, you mustn't say, "Ah, oh, that looks good," because that automatically um, that's the worst. Stops you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, the, you know the the, the the worst is when your friends are. We go through. Yeah, the, the worst is when your friends are too nice about your art. It's the most embarrassing kind of conversation yes. to go through. I think. Um, yes, that's why I think a grunt is a good thing. It's 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 not exactly non-committal, but it's a, you you don't have to put words to it. Mm. And. A lot of my friends aren't uh, involved in the art world to any degree, but it's interesting. I often cherish their opinion on my art more than uh, someone who I maybe went to art school with just because it doesn't seem um, polluted by, you know, this high polluted jar <laughs> jargon and, um, you know, kind of overly complicated uh, language about art. You just get a much more direct, I like that, I don't like that. You know that captures this it captures that so yes and 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 you get your and you get to the you know that how important it is to clean the brushes after the session and that ritual sort of lets one uh, climb down um and there's all sorts of almost fetishistic bits about mm. getting on with painting isn't it i mean my fetish is to go out into the landscape and paint on the spot um something that lucy never did and um and he would remark on this but uh, but actually um and we all have our little superstitions, don't we? And and our, 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 not exactly tricks, but habits. Um, and it was there is a kind of um, um, clan to painting. I think it's it's um, antisocial an antisocial activity, which very, has very very strong social repercussions, doesn't it? Mm. It's um, you said Freud never painted outside. And I never paint outside either. I always paint with uh, electric light just because I like the consistency of the light, not on the subject, but on the canvas itself. And I like, I, I like, I like, I like, I like light changing and that being outside and being completely subjected to the. Because I always find that can sort of throw, throw me off a bit because, you know, the sunlight so saturates the canvas that you, you can't actually quite see how the 
paint is going to look when you take it indoors. But then at the same time, oh, but come on, um, Julius, that's the great moment, you know. I know. Is it is it as good as you thought it was momentarily, or is it the absolute crap that it turns out? To well, be? well, the inverse of that is I love how my paintings look inside, but as soon as I'm take them outdoors to take them to the framers or whatever, I'm horrified by how pale they are uh, compared to you know how I viewed them inside. I'm sure there's a, there's a word for this, the, trans, the, transitory, the transition between your wishes for it and your realisation of it. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, well, it's interesting as well because there's, in your book, there's that moment where Lucien's on the bus looking at the reproduction of uh, the Picasso and he's just amazed by how vibrant it is and how uh, impervious it would be to an oversaturation of light because the colour is so strong. Yes, and and the strength of the strength of a painting is always that it's got this um, awful integrity. That sounds very pious, but um, you know it, it's we we know, don't we? And we can grunt at a picture and you know, whatever the style, manner, age, or or, or inclination. Mm. You were talking before about uh, Freud's gaze, uh, and I've always thought he almost has. Uh, in the nicest way possible sort of like shark eyes you know he's, he's just staring at everything and he, he's sort of um you, you don't get he, he's looking at things very directly and it's often said of freud's pictures in fact he said it about himself that he's uh, he painted them like animals um but then there's also the fact that he seemed to love animals more than people so i guess my question is what did it mean to freud to capture the animal in someone well I um, was at some event and I was standing um, next to um, a director of the Tate Gallery, um, who I won't name, and my whippet, um, which, had been, which had gone to the, this, this private view thing, walked past and he didn't realise it was my dog, but he just folded his arms and said, I hate animals. And I thought that meant he also hated humans and he was anti-life. I thought this was, I thought it was the most terrible thing to say. Um, and and um, Lucien's love of his whippets and, and love of horses and feeling for them and a, and a sort of affinity with them is um, very well something to be cherished I think and, it, and it's shared by well a million I mean m most of the world's population I think has feeling for um, whether it's the sacred cow or the uh, fleet horse or the wonderful whippet and um, if you haven't got a, an affinity with animals or sympathy with them, surely you, you, you can't like our, our own race um, at all. And portrait paint, that's one wonderful thing about portrait painting is that it, it's, um, as Lucian said, everything is a portrait. I mean, whatever the, the genre or the subject matter, um, but the way you, you put things into poem, composition, painting or whatever, um, it defines who we are and what our attitudes are and it's to be lauded and, um, and one can like things that one are completely unlike things that one actually makes oneself if that's that's um, it's not it's not a, a, a an either or it's a that and plus and Lucian um, is a brilliant example of that because his you talk about his shark eyes they're more than shark eyes they were kind of um, more like drills when he spotted someone he wanted to meet, uh, usually um, a woman, he would, antennae would bristle and he would dart off and it was a kind of, as though he'd gone into a different gear and he would be completely focused on that person. And of course- Almost he, electrified almost. It was really, yes. And, and it and applied of course to painting as well. I mean, it applied to all aspects of his life, um, plumping for things, jumping for things, gambling outrageously. Um, liking to be cleared out, losing was sort of, um, it, it was a kind of rescue almost um, from his hang-ups. And so one way or another, um, he was feral, I think, uh, in, a, in a way, at the same time, a, a very, very sort of civilized person. So a, a, a rather heady mixture. Mm. And I guess that points to what I was saying before about, you know, I always thought of his work as quite cold. Um, and then it's sort of almost aged like a fine wine, his work, and they sort of seem more compassionate than they seem to me at first. Um, so oh, well, I agree, but, uh, but actually, um, it's there, it's, it's without being sentimental or stuff, it's a loving attention 
and it's and it, nothing better than his portrait of his mother and her secret sequence of them over mm. um, well over ten years, and um, and the children. He's very good with children, um, which is also quite a telling sign, I think, perhaps, and um, even. The only occasions I can think of that he painted somebody he really disliked, um, the painting was a, a failure. Um, so on the whole, he's, he's very positive, unsentimental and positive. And, and it's um, almost, and, his, and his he, sit is... He, he gave an awful lot to people, as well mm. as painting. Well, he immortalised them, I guess, in the paintings, which is a gift enough. But he, it's almost, his works, I guess his subjects look bored. Not they're not cold depictions of the dead. Well, that's but that's what I'm saying. I'm, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think they're cold. More that he's spent enough time with them. Um, like when I paint someone's portrait, I have to spend at least two hours with them. I know Freud spent you know upwards mm. of a hundred hours on some of his portraits, but it's only after the person has got bored in your presence that you can really you can really capture what they really lo look like. It's, it's as though you've met somebody the first time, your conversation is very stilted to start with. It's, mm. it's, it's ritual, isn't it? You know, how are you, where did you come from, all sort of thing. Then you um, don't, well, when you get to the point where you don't have to talk, or in the case of painting them, you insist that you don't talk, perhaps, mm. and, or, or you control the talk, because it's, it's your session, it's your, your, um, your work. I think that um, in Lucien's case, there were certain kinds of people he could not paint because they they weren't sympathetic in the sense of um, being possible to be in the same room as. I think there are, there's a, there are categories of people one doesn't want to be in the same room as, and he never um, succeeded in painting or wanted to paint people like that. And of course, it demands great patience, and patience means boredom, and um, some of the more canny um, sitters but um, did they, they had themselves done then asleep or as good as sleep, asleep and in comfortable positions rather than very uncomfortable positions. Lee Bowery, um, big show off that he was, um, did the most complicated poses uh, in order to just show Lucian that he could, he could manage it. And, um, is that, and is that why Freud cherished, cherished Bowery as a sitter? Because he would allow him to try out new figurations that no other sitter would have the time for or be able to do. Yes, and and of course, um, his outrageousness impressed Lucian, and his, his his sort of absolutely blind courage. I mean, I knew Lee as as, as a somebody in mufti, um, you know, wearing a very boring wind cheetah, um, you know, a wig on or a cap, um, not not even very big. Um, and uh, so the transformation when you see this. Um, Little, little little bloke I used to meet in the stairs. Um, when you see the paintings, is that he's not just made him heroic; he's made him um, fallible and intimate, and and a bit jokey, mm -hmm. all sorts of things which you don't normally get in a portrait. And that, that was, I think, I suppose, what's so marvelous about Lucy's paintings. He actually got into the character of the person when it was a, a successful painting, and um, you saw people as as never before. But Bowery, the paintings of Bowery are almost monumental, like a almost like a Buddha or something. Is the you know. yes, he, he's he's twice the size. Uh, he's far bigger than he was in 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 life um, when he was a bit normal, and you couldn't have anything more cruel to say about um, him than that he looked normal. Um, he wanted to be um, this. Well, he was this. this uh, of course, now now this person remembered for the photographs of him in his amazing get-ups but it is significant that um that he thought that being painted by Lucian was the, the, the most true performance that he ever had and it's not stripping him naked although of course it was stripping him naked it's actually a, a sort of empathy I think. what do you think Freud painted people nude or naked and perhaps for the listeners could you go into the difference between the two um I think to be clothed is to be in a, in a certain disguise or guise. Um, you know, we do it to make ourselves look our best. Um, but the people we know best are the people um, who are naked. I mean, I was dandling my latest grandchild yesterday and uh, feeling his, he, young enough, being 
you know, less than a month old, young enough to feel his skin and um, feel that his nakedness was is just the full baby. Um, and um, in any intimate relationship, uh, nakedness stops being um, odd and becomes normal, doesn't it? And, and Lucien did have this ability to paint people naked as though they were clothed or clothed as though they were naked. Um, it, it's a remarkable thing. Franz Hals could do it, Rubens could do it, Rembrandt could do it. Um, it's, and of course it's what if one goes through life rooms, drawing these poor people just standing around and being, um, you know, holding still. In a life room, it's a kind of um, exercise that's being done by art students, if they do it at all. And in Lucien's case, paint someone in a was simply a matter of being um, on good terms with someone that the whole thing about being naked lost its um, lost its sort of novelty and became normal. And that's, that, and that, that's, oh, that's, that's so good. That's interesting what you just said that he painted clothed people like they were naked and naked people like they were clothed because I, I'd, I guess his paintings of people wearing clothes, they really do look more vulnerable than his nude subjects. And I guess that's possibly because his nude subjects, he was comfortable enough with them that they would pose for him nude in the first place. Yes. Yes. That, and if he's painting Heine Thiessen of, you know, the, of, of huge wealth, um, it would have been just that bit too bizarre to have had him naked, I think. Um, anyhow, he, he didn't get Heine Thiessen, Thiessen um, naked. Um, and yes, it, it, the nakedness denotes a kind of intimacy, doesn't it? And um, the, the, the ultimately rich or, um, well, Alfie, his Irish bookie, marvellous portraits, um, but actually I, the mind, my, my mind boggles at seeing Alfie naked, but, but, but dressed every bit of his suit and his cufflinks and his signet ring and all those things uh, are part of the portrait. Um, uh, I, th I think there's a slight um, gap between painting someone naked and someone clothed, which um, was never quite bridged. I mean, they're, they're more formal dress portraits and the naked ones are more uh, jokey, intimate. And that's what we've all experienced, I suppose, in, in, in relationships. Um, on the so, whole, my doctor sorry. is not somebody I'd expect to see naked. Mm. <laughs> it, it is, it's almost as if he paints people paints people as if they're wearing their nakedness like they're wearing high-end fashion like they're wearing their body like it's a you know an Armani jacket or something they he, yes he's captured confidence in in and a, a comfortable comfortable comfortability if that's a word I think in, I think generally yes generally speaking that the people who pose for him naked were comfortable about it and uh, and even to, even could almost demand it because they were proud of their bodies and or um, didn't give a damn um, it's 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 that every single painting is a new negotiation, I suppose, isn't it? And, and, uh, and whatever it is. So if it's a bunch of flowers, that's also a naked flowers and or clad flowers. His portraits of people are obviously not photorealist, but in a sense, they were more real than uh, the people themselves. How do you think Freud achieved this? And how did he put more of someone on the canvas than was perhaps even there in uh, reality? Well, um, I talked about this with, with Frank on our Monday evenings, often enough, and Frank said that the amazing thing about Lucien was that when anybody, including himself or me, would have thought it was finished, Lucien would say, it isn't, and it wasn't. And Lucien would go one further. Um, and when a painting works, it's that it looks as though there's been nothing quite like, quite like it before. And I think we all aspire to doing things that haven't been quite like anything before. Most of us produce, I mean, I'm speaking about myself, um, produce cliches very often, more often than not. Um, I feel, I feel the same. Lucien loathed the cliche, but you know how easy it is to, <laughs> um, to, to kid oneself with the cliche. Uh, he, it's, it's not extra realism, but it's an extra intensity. 
and it's the, it's the equivalent intensity, the intensity of the gaze of actually examining something. And when Lucien was, as I was saying earlier, when he was um, spotting someone across a room and going up and, and um, talking uh, to them, it was an intense, you sort of felt the electricity coming off. Um, it was extraordinary, as though, a, you know, a, a lion pounced, ready to pounce. It was a kind of um, a marauding thing almost. And then when that bout is over, the paintings had to have a bit of the zing of, of um, special attention, piercing attention. Um, and it was a very, very, very remarkable thing about Lucien. And I suppose in a way that does um, line up with his grandfather, which is um, go, to go on and on and on and on year after year until the, the, the subject somehow, I don't know, feels um, more confident in itself, herself. Um, it's almost as if he paints more muscles on the face and the body than are actually there. Except that as people are never tired of saying, um, uh, uh, that people grow to look like their portraits. And, and it's true. And Her Majesty, our Queen, um, is, has got to look more like a Freudian self over the years. Yeah. In that very remarkable little titchy portrait, which takes I, I, I think it's a, I think it's the best portrait. portrait of her, although she'd probably hate to hear that. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's, it's a marvellous painting of her, and, and it's just the size of a shoebox. And, um, well, that's he extended reality. it. He extended it, didn't he? Because he wasn't happy with how uh, tight the cropping was. Yes, it's a, it's a slight extra bit of tiara, yes. Mm. What effect did the breakup with Caroline Blackwood have in the early development of his style? Um, I think he was, it was more his age, um, young middle age, um, coming out from under the shadow of Bacon um, and feeling um, that he hadn't even really started. Um, his sort of youthful style dropped away. Um, I don't think the Caroline Blackwood relationship um, had very much bearing on it because um, it was with her, it was the first time he got sort of money um, galore because she was extremely rich. Um, and so he could afford to smash up cars and things at more than usual rate and he could afford a horse and, <laughs> and, and, and so on. But it, it rapidly pulled. He couldn't, he, the relationship broke down for all sorts of reasons, but among them, leading among them as a, as a painter, I think it was that it um, sort of put him out to grass slightly and um, it, it stopped him being neck and neck like a jockey um, or a gambler. And on the whole, he really got started as a painter, I think, after that period in the 1950s. Um, it's when he had to learn how to be a middle-aged artist and he had to learn, learn how to be an old artist. Um, and it, it has an effect on the way one looks at things, I suppose. Do you think he's, because the portrait he does of himself with Caroline in the apartment in Paris, I think is the first, I might be wrong, but I think it's the first painting where he really depicts either himself with someone or just someone by themselves, but someone who he was in quite a tense relationship with. It's the first time he sort of honestly uh, depicts the, um, the tension between him and someone. Well, else. I think his Lorna Wishart, his first girlfriend, um, they are quite, by comparison, were quite, quite crude, but little tiny paintings, once in the uh, Museum of Modern Art, and I've never seen it on show there. Um, oh, yes, I have once. Um, the, 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 the images um, change from being sort of iconic to being um, full face, close up, um, intense. I think the great risks came after Caroline and before Caroline, he was a young, um, a sort of novice really, um, and doing amazing, some amazing paintings. The, the one of Kitty with the dog, his first wife with the dog. On the couch. That that painting. Is, that the, is that the painting on the, of her on the couch with the breast exposed and the dog at her feet? Um, it was, well, I can tell you it was, it was the, the Tate's best selling postcard um, after his retrospective and hadn't been before. And it went on being in the best taste, taste best selling postcard. What that proves, I don't know, except that it's become a popular icon. And um, what well, do you think it's important for, do you think it's important for, I mean, can you use 
how well a painting is received by the public as a good barometer for its success? Yes, I think so, to, to, to some extent. Um, there was, I don't know if it, if it achieved, Alanda, but um, there was a painter whose name escapes me who painted a butler on a beach with a semi-naked girl um, and uh, he was offering her a glass of champagne or something. And it was a really ter terrible picture, so terrible that, that it was always entertaining. And that was top of the hit parade for some years. And, and I'm sure terrible paintings, are corny, slick, just, just, uh, just as in music, um, they, they become um, the, 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 the most popular in town. Uh, but among, shall we say among painters, our exclusive gaggle, um, I think it's, it's if one could be relatively confident that the one that people, uh, that painters admire most is the one that counts. Do um, you think there's a problem in the art world today where too much art needs to be explained by people who are perceived to have a high knowledge of art? I think that's always a, a problem. I, I find that um, on the whole, academic art historians are terrified of meeting a real artist um, a living because they're, they're messy and they have ideas which come from a very crude sources very often or basic and, and um, it's like, I'm sure it's like being, if you're an actor watching others act on the stage, you have far more tenterhooks, insight, worry, excitement, and jealousy, all these things, than if you're just a, a, an ordinary punter in the public. Um, but there is something to be said for somebody producing pictures that hit, uh, catch the imagination. Um, and you've got to have an awful lot to you to achieve that, it does. It's not necessarily the kitsch that survives. It's um, the, the stuff that really um, appeals to our deepest, deepest feelings. I think. Do you think there's almost a academic elitism in the more sort of postmodern strain of art being produced today? I wouldn't want to be a global generalizer, um, but I think. Um, but there are some truths. Art historians and academics, some of them, um, not all of them, but some of them get completely caught up in um, sort of data, which is completely irrelevant. Um, and they don't perhaps quite grasp that each new painting is a fresh start. And that we as painters um, are, are trying all the time to um, do something that, that needs doing urgently quite urgently um, and there are all sorts of um, ways of rationalizing that which on the whole um, detract. I mean academic theories about what's been done in paint are never as powerful as what's been done in paint. That's why Sickert as a, as a critic, newspaper critic, was so much better than his contemporaries as, as critics, um, a, a brilliant critic. Um, and Ruskin, although he became a boring old nutter, um, was brilliant at description of things that excited him, which is equivalent to seeing a painting, I suppose. Mm. And um, and the best critics have a certain sort of relish, I think, which is also helpful. Um, because yeah, that goes to what I was saying before with the sort of insistence on a progression of uh, formal stylistic genres in that. I mean, a lot of critics will say, you know, after Pollock or de Kooning, what's the point in doing representational painting? But I've always thought, that that's that implies that all the ideas that can be conveyed through representational painting were done prior to Pollock. When you know, I think oh, that's that, that's it, it's that is so trite and it's so it's mm. like saying that future generations mustn't have meals because meals have been eaten already. And yes, <laughs> quite as profound as that, I think. Yeah, yeah. Which which painting do you think first indicated that Freud would become the artistic genius that he did? What was his first big breakthrough? Well, I really like his 951 painting of Harry Diamond standing in front of a potted par palm, um, which won him a prize and made his name um, for the first time. And that's in Liverpool City Art Gallery. And it's and it's pretty startling. And, and I, th I think I like it because it's, it's uh, it comes from a period when I'm, I, I find a period bef before one was around 
I think it's particularly interesting. So I don't know quite what the reason for that is, but that painting strikes me as from the period before I was around. And so it's like a kind of a loud hailer from the past. And I like that particularly, but, but there are paintings that I love his painting of buttercups, but I also love his um, amazing painting of Lee and his wife, uh, Nicola Bateman, um, lying stretched out on a couch. Um, I like one or two of the big Sioux paintings. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I like this, that and the other. And of course the etchings are, are remarkable, amazing and um, good to live with. Um, was he a, was Freud a draftsman at all in the sense that we have uh, finished drawings come down to us or did he always paint directly onto the canvas and did he always scratch directly onto the copper plate with his etchings? Um, he was, he, he used each each separate medium or, or, or support as, as quite separate things, but um, drawings would be just as important um, as a painting. The painting was more long term, I suppose, and also better survival quality because drawings fade. Um, I think, and, and, the, and the etchings were ways of making his work available. Um, he, he argued, you know, 40 to 70 copies of each one rather than have just the unique, one unique object. It was a way of, of spreading things also to go there. Um, and, um, and it was also different from, you know, scratching on a plate from painting processes. And that was a bit of a relief um, when he was very caught up in the painting. Um, actually, I think this is Picasso, of course, um, but very few 20th century artists um, did us so well in all three um, areas of expertise. And Bacon couldn't do an etching if he tried and he did reproductions instead, for example. Um, Bacon didn't draw really, stroke couldn't draw, um, didn't see it was worth his while. And Lucien's drawings are a, a, thing, a thing in their own right. Um, That's what I find so strange about that group, Albach, Bacon and Freud, is that there's not a paper trail that points to their uh, technical development. You don't, I mean, Bacon just seems to enter the scene uh, with amazing facility. And there's not, you, there's not the academic drawings to look back on that you get with a lot of other artists. And the same seems to be true of Freud and Albach. Yes, well, there are, there are um, uh, start with Albach, there are, there are loads of, um, sketchbooks because he just draw, draws and draws and draws and draws but they're fewer for the work he does in the studio because he doesn't he does not erect his studio his, his easel outside um and never never has done um lucian um liked the magic of of etching um that and when we would go and, and uh, etch the plate in and watch the bubbles rising and and then get the first pull the first proof um that was a kind of uh, very tense magic game. Um, one etching would take as long as any painting to do, so it was, it was they were equivalent in that way. Really? But, but yes, and, and Bacon, of course, um, had this thing of, of being instinctive. And you've got to be very beware of people who say they're instinctive because they usually aren't. They're usually deeply pre-programmed. And he really had no use for drawing because his Paintings were meant to be sort of apparitions. I think uh, that was his amb ambition. Um, and it, so there are no drawings of any, to any effect really, and no, no prints because that demands again, more consider deep consideration. He wanted to be the, the ringmaster, I think, um, doing spontaneous paintings. And, and as long as they were spontaneous, it was, it was fine. I always find there's something very aesthetically satisfying about uh, being able to see the process of how a painting was made. And sort of that's why I find, I think, I think photorealist painting isn't nearly as exciting because you sort of, yes. what, what's the difference between that and a photo, but something like an etching, which so exposes. Pixels is the difference, isn't it? Sorry, what was that? Pix pixels is the difference, isn't it? Yes. Pixels yeah, yeah. can do it better and, and are more interesting. Exactly. You're, you're just as disconnected from the artist as you would be from the printer printing out your photo if it's when it's photorealist. Yes. But with yeah. with etching in particular, you're, you're so aware of the process. I mean, uh, in a painting, obviously, you don't have to cross hatch, but in uh, an etching, you're very aware that that collection of you know, hatches is 
why that looks like a shadow. And I've always felt that makes something very aesthetically satisfying. In the same, same way, I think bacon is so satisfying to look at because you're so aware of, um, you know, planned or not, the, the accident that he splashes onto, yes. the, onto the canvas. And it's you're, you're and, aware and, of and, and, and realize that your, your accident is actually a, 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 being a great benefit. It's, it sparks a big mm. shot. Yeah, yes. yeah, and you're aware of the the action that that's taken yes. place to to reveal it to you. Um, Freud's personality always seems to be at odds with his subject matter. I think because he strikes me as a very sort of bemused individual who never took things too seriously, but his art, on the other hand, has a distinct seriousness and intensity to it. Would you agree with that? This is Lucian. Lucian, yeah. Yes. Um, Occasionally, when he was broke, he did little pictures of flowers and, and, and strawberries and things, which um exquisite, but actually a bit daft. And and that's how he thought, came to see them, I think. Um, they were done in order to get a bit of money together. Um, on the whole, I think the stuff he allowed to survive and the stuff that um, he's remembered for is the most is what happens to be the most intense, intensively um, sort of one. But mm. unlike his grandfather, he was much more of a participant. I mean, I, I imagine his grandfather sitting on his chair with the, you know, the patient fa facing away from him um, was a setup, and Sigmund Freud wasn't really um, doing anything except sort of listen or make as if he was listening. But Lucian is both on the couch and facing the couch at the same time. But you could almost, aside from possibly Bacon, you could say that Freud's subject matter is more serious, whatever that means, than any other painter of the 20th century. But he, he always seems like such a, you know, he's always just reciting sort of uh, poems and sort of joking poems. Oh. And he seems like a very bemused. Um, he, he didn't take himself or his work too seriously, except when he was painting it. Absolutely, that's true. Um, but equally, um, when he saw his retrospective sort of on the walls, he didn't really, he, this is, this is the one I did in 2002, um, he didn't really want to see it, he wanted to, he, he left it to me entirely sort of to hang it and, and, and everything and make the selection, um, looked it over and, and grunted and said that was all right, but didn't want to be seen to be being a showman in himself. Um, and when he saw the, fin the finished exhibition, he went round it. Um, he was pleased at the look of some things, but the thing that really made him run away and not go back except once in the entire run of it, and it went you know, to Europe and, and, and the States, he said that so many people in, in the paintings were dead had died, I mean, literally died. And it was, it was, it sort of had come to haunt him. And he was really much more dis disconcerted by the number of people he had once been living and he'd kept alive in paint. And, and there it was, a kind of mausoleum in a way. Um, and, and that would have seemed more disturbing to him, I imagine, just because of, you know, he, he always talks about him, him too. Well, for him too, but just him, him talking about the, his works seem, the, the figures he paints seem to live a life of their own and they almost live biologically. They're not just representations. And um, Yes, I mean, they're more memorable than the person themselves in a way. Mm. Um, yes. Do you um, think, do you think he viewed himself in the, in the context of the great masters? Did he, did he strive to be the Picasso of his age? Well, I, I, remember, I remember very well, we went to Paris for the day um, to see a langer exhibition which I said he really must see and he, and he um he loved that because anger pursued things to an end which wasn't his end um you know there was sort of no competition uh, and, and um, no not not that much overlap and I think he was I think and I suppose we all have dreams of immortality um which normally life just squashes within seconds doesn't it but um if you have produced such memorable things which people can refer to as as being um 
favorite paintings or, or, or things that travel miles to see um, and all these sort of aspects, then you do get, find yourself propelled into a certain kind of exclusive category, I suppose, um, because there are very few people who produce work that um, is instantly recognizable and, uh, and appeals to people and, and disgusts people too, of course, as well, some, some people. It's, it's a very strange state to grow old as a painter and you go old um, usually managing to work longer than most people. I mean, sportsmen have given up decades before and, and, um, and, and writers tend to loathe their, their writing equipment um, and, and poets dry up and painters carry on because it's like a kind of physical exercise, isn't it? And it's quite healthy apart from lead white. Lead white. Um, and well, all, all one can look, look is, is sort of stand back and, and marvel, I suppose, and um, be pleased when the person dies that, that all the work's there. And it's, but it's no substitute for the person themselves. But it's, um, it's, it's so astonishing to achieve that kind of um, distinction. Mm. Do you think the, I mean, I've always thought that the motivation for a lot of creatives and whether they know it or not is having a kind of life beyond death, um, which you kind of gain from making things. And I think when people talk about being scared of death, what they really mean is they're scared that the world goes on without them and that they become irrelevant. And art, I think, helps people uh, defy this. I mean, if I stopped, if I stopped, painting or doing any of the work that I do, it would feel like a kind of death to me. Yes, I think I, it's, 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 it, it gives, gives, gives one's meaningless life meaning, doesn't it? Um, um, Turner used to go on about his children and, and the children that were cripples and the paintings that didn't quite work were the ones he sort of protected more fiercely than anything else. Um, and Turner had, didn't have any acknowledged children, so the pictures were his children. Um, and it, yes, it's it's a bit of an illusion, though, isn't it? Uh, because actually, um, you know, a flood, fire, storm, um, global warming can do for most um, buildings and most paintings, possibly. Um, but it is life extending, isn't it? Yes. Mm. And, yeah, because, and it's a, it's a great, a very good preoccupation. It's better than making wars and and, and um, inventing horrible things and um, stealing things or and robbing people of things. It's it's the wonderful thing that Matisse did. People accuse him of being um, too complacent during the Second World War. Well, bloody hell! Um, actually, Matisse produced has produced more net worth, joy, and pleasure since his death than most people have managed. Mm. Um, and it's the most immediate, it needs no translation, so it's universal, which is also a good thing. It's got absolutely nothing to do with diversity or anything. It's all those labels and epithets and categories mm. disappear in the face of whoever did it. Um, mm. Yeah, universality is better than striving for diversity, I think. Um, yes, I think that's a good yeah. example. But it's kind of because if you're into art, you're not really into just art, but you're into the personalities that created art. So it's kind of like you and I know Michelangelo very well, even though yes. he lived 500 years ago. And I guess that sort of, I don't know, I, want, I just wonder how subconscious that motivation is for all creatives. And I think you have to be, uh, you have to keep it in your back pocket rather than uh, flaunt it. Um, but it's, it's, it's incredibly reassuring, I think, that the great thing, most memorable things in the entire world, which includes um, pyramids and, and all sorts of, of objects, as well as paintings, um, are, 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 are criteria in a way, aren't they? They're the, the things that appeal generation after generation after generation. That's reassuring. Uh, whereas um, you know, Hitler was basically rather a negative little bugger, and um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the little man is the little man, as Freud called him. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Uh, with the great artists, the interesting thing about them is that their uh, morals or ethical standards 
seem completely in sync with ours today. I mean, you read Shakespeare and I mean, who who's done, I mean, Othello's a better commentary on uh, race and racial hatred and um, a whole ton of different emotions and feelings than uh, any work of art that's created in the last 20 years, even though we're a yes. lot more conscious of... Um, a lot of us are Iago, aren't we? I yeah. Think, um, yeah. A lot of people. Mm. But it's but it's interesting how that's almost what makes a, a artist timeless is that their morals or their values, I should say, uh, are, are timeless and, and survive yes. the generations. Um, it's, it's amazing and how every child, theoretically, every child growing up will suddenly be aware of these things or these writings or these sounds and um, it's best not to be too self-conscious of it at the time I think I'd advise the great artist mm -hmm. and you know it's it, it's 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 marvelous to think that um, this planet throws up the memorable um, and that these are forces for good and on the whole they're forces for, they are to do with enlightenment rather than um, obscurity and venom um, and, 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 and the great artists who are not the ones that declare themselves great artists but the ones that um, opinion makes great or reinforces um, are treasures, literally they're treasures aren't they? Do you think artists can not just sort of abide by a moral code that we now adhere to but can almost create the moral code in the sense like that's a good example like harold bloom when he's talking about um romeo and juliet he says that there's no example of the infatuated teenage girl before juliet in literature history anything and it's it's almost like how powerful is art can art literally create uh these value systems and the way we look at the world Yes, I think so. And 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 um, artists taking things by surprise. I mean, there's a form of autism which produce um, the most creative, fertile, brilliant results. Uh, perhaps, although in social terms, uh, autism doesn't just doesn't fit in. It doesn't have a role. Mm. It does have a role, uh, and that is to um, set new, not targets, set new horizons, perhaps, uh, or new new ventures. And uh, Frank's rather fond of saying that, of course, in the long run, it's just one or two things that survive. And um, and the, the job of us um, is to join in the join in the in the in the race game. Um, and we aren't necessarily the winners, um, because and nobody can actually necessarily forecast who is the, going to be the winner. And the ones who uh, infant prodigies, generally speaking, turn out badly. And the uncouth, dishevelled person in the corner of the room, back of the class, very often turns out to be the one who makes the blinding uh, discoveries and achievements. Um, I'm oh, sure you can think of people that do that, and I can certainly, I'm not going to name them. But, um, no, you know, sure. it, it's, it's, an, it's, it's, can't, it's not something one wishes upon oneself or, or aspires to. But one can recognise it in others, um, I think, and it's and, and marvel at it. I'm. Uh, this is quite exciting for me because I'm. Frank Auerbach's probably my favourite uh, living artist. Um, what's he like as a, as a person, and what's it like to be, uh, such close friends with him? Um, he's the most extraordinarily generous, and and um, for, for someone who's pretty reclusive and regards being reclusive as, as normal. He's inspires immense uh, friendship and loyalty. Uh, his little gang, um, we talk We talk on a Thursday morning at the moment, you know, because of lock, lock times. And he hasn't quite got back to a full studio um, arrangement. And he was 90 three weeks ago. Um, he's someone who's who could have described himself as a refugee who deprived of his parents you know, because they died in Auschwitz um, and he doesn't um, and and he's produced this sort of um, this 
parade of, of paintings of his local surroundings and of people he knows, um, which, which to my mind are, are um, unparalleled really at the moment, but um, I don't want to look at him like that. I don't want to look at him as a friend. We have, you know, jokes and, and books and um, there's a particular channel on the telly, uh, channel 80, 81, which shows mainly bad B movies from the 1950s. So, you know, we both love that. Um, and I don't know, but it's, it's a great privilege to be able to um, be there and um, see, the, see the works coming out. His portraits of you are uh, some of his best, I think. Well, I don't recognize them really, but... Um, but, but then, of course, most, most sitters for Frank probably wouldn't. No, we, 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 are, we, we are certainly a, a gaggle of people, which includes Julia, his wife, of course, and, um, and Jake, his son. Um, we, we are, I don't know, we, in our way, we are like the dogs that, that accompany the, the master. I suppose, um, and um, it's yes, it's it's it's, uh, it's very very touching and rewarding, and also wonderfully boring. Um, sometimes sitting there, but um, how long do you have to? How long does a sitting with Frank Alvar take? I, I, I do two 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 hours, six to eight on a Monday, um, and I'm I'm I've missed it terribly. I mean, we all, we all missed. You know, we all had this funny life over the last eighteen months or so. Um, I, I miss this terribly, this complete ritual. I wouldn't take, you know, apart from an occasional holiday, um, the most important thing of the week is almost like going to the shrink. Um, mm -hmm. And we're, we're all of us longing for it to resume. Um, what, did, then we all, <laughs> what did Lucien mean to Frank Auerbach and what was um, Lucien's passing like for him? Um, Lucien relied on Frank to um, do the grunt, um, you know, at, the, at, the, at each new painting. Um, and Frank was in the habit of getting up at sort of five o'clock in the morning, so this would be very early in the day, usually, for them to, you know, to check up on progress. Um, it didn't apply in adverse reverse so much. I mean, Frank didn't expect or want Lucien particularly to come and look at each picture as it was done. But, but Lucien was um, bought so many of Frank's paintings um, and loved them because they weren't what he did, I think partly. Um, and it just shows the sort of the, 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 the wide, wide, wide range of, of, of um, innovation and, and brilliance. Did, did Lucien value Al Bach and Bacon's opinion on his work more than any other artist or more than any other person? Yes. Um, yes, certainly. Um, and it's, it's nice to get another opinion um, because it's, um, it, it just takes the weight off of deciding, even if the, the remark that somebody makes um, is something you, he doesn't agree with, um, as if this is Lucian. Um, he very happily um, accepts that that person's opinion is wrong and that encourages him to bang on in a different direction. So it's, it's the outside voice and, and um, a pair of fresh pair of specs, basically. And um, Frank, I think, is possibly more confident that he can ring up the gallery and get the painting removed and left to dry on top of a filing cabinet um, or in some inconspicuous place for a while until the black and white photograph comes through which she does which she likes as a check on whether the painting works or not um, and and then it's out into the world and he doesn't see it again um, it's, a, it's a very strange process um, and, and frank produces it it's slightly more productive than lucy in terms of quantities of paintings um, but, but they're comparable all along. Who were some of Freud's favourite artists? Um, uh, Titian by uh, Titian House. Titian first and foremost. Um, Rembrandt. What what did he like about Titian? 
in particular? He liked his old age um, greatly and his extreme braveness in um, the particular Diana and Actian, I think it was perhaps of all the paintings. Um, and the, the sheer um, muffled grandeur of Titian, particularly in old age. And I suppose that it's pretty obvious for an institution who's done the painting and not his, not his, his studio assistants very much. Um, and I think he, he liked, the, liked the idea of, of, yes, these paintings endure and they're as alive today as they were in the 16th century. Um, and I imagine he would have liked Titian's, I mean, Titian seems not that he wasn't, you know, one of the most competent draftsmen that there's ever been, but he seems to break from that sort of rigid anatomical um, approach that a lot of the artists from the Renaissance had at times. Like he'd be a lot looser with his figuration than say Michelangelo would or uh, Raphael would. And I, and I kind of see a parallel between yes. that and Lucien's approach to figuration. Yes, I mean, uh, the, um, both, um, well, Lucien was anti, you know, he didn't like, didn't like Raphael and didn't like, um, saving your presence, didn't like Florentine painting quite so much, didn't set, really dislike Piero della Francesca, mainly because everybody else likes Piero so much, and, um, and thought Michelangelo's um, architecture was perhaps better than his sculpture. <laughs> really? Uh, I find well, that so strange. Know, that's just being provocative, but the, I, I, the, the Laurentian Library um, is, is so wonderful. And um, he was a contrarian to a lot of a tradi to, yeah. traditional taste. But you were speaking to someone who's actually touched the hand of God on the Sistine Chapel roof. <laughs> Quite a while it's been you have. Ended. Yes. yes. What? And it's, what was that like? Well, it's it's amazing how how loosely painted it all is. Just well, well, one of the hands is, but one of them isn't. Yes, did, well, they, they very, but, but the whole the whole spread and there was a, a very precarious scaffold right up to the ceiling, and I was allowed up. Because um, one of them one of them was repainted years later, as yeah. I think. Whereas one, so the hand of Adam is the one that's got all the clumsy um, brushwork in yes, the hand. But, but, the, but the clumsiness is marvelous. Um, close up, it's it's you could see um, what the kick he got out of doing it. That'd be but like touch on ground level. You just say wow, and that's that's about it, isn't it? So, so sorry, how, how did you, why were you allowed to touch it? When was this when it was being restored in the eighties? I was, I happened to be in, in Rome with um, um, the, uh, the woman who's, who's then editing the Burlington magazine, which is the Echt, mm. I suppose, academic magazine, which is not widely read by artists. Um, and, and door doors open to her. And um, we were going down the stanza, uh, and I heard this strange um, uh, 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 noise um, from some room down in this corridor of the Vatican on our way to the Sistine Chapel. And I, I, I was mildly alarmed by it because it sounded as though somebody was dying. And our German guide said, don't worry, it is the Pope. <laughs> Should have been very worried. <laughs> yes, even more worried. Yes. Yeah. Anyhow, it, it, that was that was the sort of open sesame was was the verdict to magazine in that case. <clears throat> Sorry, that vape got me good there. Yeah. How many children did Freud have, and how did this affect his life? Do you think? I don't know. Uh, to be to be frank, quite often, but there were, there were more than fifteen, uh, quite a few more, I think, um, and. The criteria for judging them by is whether he um, ha had dealings with them or not in later life, whether they got on with them. Um, and this didn't stop people queuing up to have babies by him. So it was a, a kind of Rabelaisian um, dream or nightmare, I think. But did he, was he hesitant to? get involved in commitments that would take him away from his work, such as children or marriage. Yes, well, he always said, he, he always he, he liked to make a distinction between himself and me. Um, he once sat me on what he called a baby's table as a dinner, um, surrounded by 
people who, and, and also Francis Wyndham, who he thought was sympathetic to women and to women with children. <laughs> he it was an element of farce. I mean, you know, the, um, he was extremely generous financially and, and in, in, in kindly ways. Um, but if he didn't get on with certain children, that was it. I mean, he, he found them boring and it was most unfair, invidious. Um, but his first passion was, of course, his, his as it were, his painted babies, his paintings and his ability to carry on. And as he said, it, a domestic life wasn't for him. Um, it isn't for most, many artists. Um, the, the obsession of gets in the way, doesn't it, of, of um, domestic duties and obligations and in desires as well, perhaps. Well, there's always the, yeah, the paranoia that you might still be a great artist if you settle down, but you might, you won't be as great as if you hadn't. And I've just seen a, a very nice play about um, Johann Sebastian Bach and his dynasty of children and so on, most of whom died in shortly after childbirth. Um, but you know, the choice you make, isn't it? Um, priorities. Um, Could you also talk a bit about the gambling habits of Freud and Bacon and what that suggested about them as people and about their art. And could you also give a few uh, examples of the debts that uh, Freud racked up just for the sake of the listeners as well? Well, he rang up one day and said he'd, he'd done, I think, I, I don't know the terms, but three days at the Cheltenham Festival, um, he'd won absolutely, literally millions, four, four or five million. Um, uh, this could have been an exaggeration, but the next, the following day, he rang up and said he'd lost it all. Uh, so it came and went. So, <laughs> so, so he gambled four to five million dollars within a day that he'd just won. He would do, but, and and he went on. He he sort of wanted, it was like clearing his throat or um, cleaning cleaning the washing up sink. Um, swish it out. Um, he wanted to prove that he could take it and that loss left him with a wonderful uh, empty feeling. Um, but he also admitted that as soon as he got making serious money, and he had by, basically by the time he had his New York dealer, um, the, the attraction of putting bets on um, diminished enormously. Um, Just because he was making and, so and much it, money. It, well, it, was, it, it became a bit meaningless. Um, he, it, it had to hurt. Um, and the thrill of the chase, the thrill of the um, moment was very much like, I don't know, Sherlock Holmes taking his, you know, dose of opium to, to get him through a, a dull day when uh, nothing much had happened in the painting. Mm. Well, what did Freud think of the prices his work was going for at the latter part of his career? And did it seem ludicrous to him that they were going for tens of millions? Um, quiet satisfaction, I think, is the answer. Uh, of course, most of them got them, made the real money uh, on resale, in which case, he, you know, he didn't benefit directly. Um, and uh, the one thing he didn't like was was people um, flogging things off that didn't ex deserve to exist that he should have destroyed. He felt which happened every, every so often, um, and that made him absolutely furious. Um, but no, he was he was a great admirer of his New York dealer um, Bill Aquavella um, for his his ability to uh, genius at selling to the richest people in the world. Um, yeah, but it was un sort of unreal, it had nothing to do with the clutter of the studio itself. Um, not much to do with his daily life. Um, but it gave him a bit of satisfaction when he out, uh, outclassed Bacon from time to time. And that, that, that meant that was just a childish competition, I suppose. And, and did he like Aquavella because Aquavella was sort of the, the first dealer to really indulge and love his more they're not pornographic pictures but they're more explicit images well actually um james kirkman his previous dealer was extremely good for him but um was rather nervous of him aquavella had the supreme advantage of having uh, bought and sold the entire pierre matisse gallery um archives uh, an old backlog of pictures um was richer than most of his clients um and a very genial um, sort of Italian descent, paterfamilias, um, 
Lucian liked the setup. He liked the distance, really. Um, it meant that things weren't quite so, quite so urgent. Um, and on the whole, um, I think there was a quiet satisfaction to be gained. But he tried to make the money mean little or nothing to him. And um, and of course, when he died, he, he there was nothing in the way of paintings to speak of in the artist's estate. Um, it was all sold, which is, for most uh, uh, painters' point of view, all that stuff you leave behind when you die, it had been taken care of already. Um, and I think that was more important to him than the actual money fetch. Do you think Freud's technical ability got better and better and better the later he got into his career? I mean, I'm, that might sound like an obvious thing to happen, but as I'm sure you know, uh, as an artist, my experience with a lot of artists is that when, once they reach a skill level that is, you know, reaps financial success or um, acclaim, their skill generally sort of plateaus a bit. But I mean, I'm thinking of like the uh, benefit supervisor nude and Freud's paintings seem to just constantly get more and more uh, compositionally complex and uh, each nude seems better than the last. Yes, um, it, until, I, until I think the very end, I think um, the last three or four years, he was not, not very well and his memory was going and, and things got a bit hazy, but still pretty remarkable for, you know, in someone in his late eighties. Um, I think actually um, one can pick out from every period, even from his childhood drawings, um, things that really still hit the mark or excite you or astonish you or disgust you possibly keep even. Uh, but on the whole, he, he didn't, he, he avoided that terrible, the midlife crisis in painters um, and worst of all, the skidding around on the heels of success painter. Um, I mean, for example, your own Sidney Nolan, I think, um, I, I like his work less and less as it progresses through his life. Um, mm. And and the, the, manfully, um, he and uh, Lucien and, and Frank always say that um, so long as you've done one or two pictures that are really good, that's all that matters. And I think that's something that Sickert said um, as well. So it's it's a mistake to dwell on the sort of what you might call geriatric works or the or in fact the ju juvenile works um, or the boring middle aged works. I mean, you can knock every stage in a life but the great thing is to keep the flame going and um, um, and the ability to take people by surprise at how, how extraordinary um, some accomplishments of them, all of them are. And do you, do you think they perhaps the reason why they look like they're getting better and better is because I haven't had that like Bacon, Albach, which I don't know about Albach as much but Bacon and Freud didn't have that academic um, background as much. I mean I know um, Freud no, none of them. None of them are academic at all. Um, mm, but they, the so-called School of London. Um, the only one near being academic is, is Kitai himself, who is American and mm. didn't really fit in. But he was a person who invented, the, more or less, invented the term. But because um, well, there's there's that quote from um, Peter Watson at the end of the chap, one of your chapters, where uh, he says Freud was one of those people who must learn everything by trial, error, and your own experience, and uh, that could be said of Albach and Bacon as well, but yes. because because they're not cementing their style in an academic background, there's always constant room for improvement. It's just applying their own relationship to something or their own experience with something more and more and more. I think it's a great parlor game to play. Um, that um, who name the artist who got better and grander in old age? I think Titian. Titian, yeah, probably does it, and Rembrandt certainly. Mm. Um, stops being a clever clogs and becomes profound. And I think Bacon was hit a plateau, had about five years of, of doing nothing wrong, brilliant, and then faded away. Lucien didn't really fade away at all, but um, the, the painting got less and less in the last years. Um, and that's just bodily frailty and, and mental frailty isn't it and um that applies for all of us um everybody um but art seems to keep people 
sharper in old age than almost any other occupation, I think. Well, if you stand up to paint, that's that's good, isn't it? Mm. Yes, it, it does. And and I, I, being a schizophrenic and you know art writer part um, painter, it's the painting I warm to much more than the writing. And I think with Frank, it's been um, this constant rehearsing of the same thing over and over again and making something fresh. Um, it's a great consolation in old age, I think. Uh, yes. Um, the use of so many quotes by Lucian in your book was interesting, I thought, because in one sense, the biography is going to be slightly less accurate because of this saturation of quotes, because yeah. all the stories are subject to his biases and his account of certain events. But in another sense, it's far more personal to Freud. You've almost prioritised his world, his view of the world rather than the world's view of him, if that makes sense. Yes, I thought it was, I, I, as the book grew, I thought it was necessary to, to um, um, as I'd got this unique, vast number of um, conversations, um, and it was good to get him into it, um, his very peculiar way of speaking, his, um, his negative remarks as well as his praise. Um, and then I thought, and, and then I thought, set it against the accounts from other people, um, and not not so much my colleagues, as it were, but but people who knew him. And I didn't want it to be an aesthetic book, or let alone an academic book. I wanted to be um, bursting with um, the the sillinesses and also the um, ambitions and the and the dislikes and the likes. Um, possibly rather indulgent, but there's a life of Nollikins, the uh, early 19th century um, portrait sculptor um, by antiquary Smith, which is full of this man's ridiculous behaviour and curious remarks. And of course, it's Boswell's Johnson, which preserves Rock Johnson. Um, and I thought this, this, should, this book should be a, a real um, loss leader, so to speak for further studies, which can be take whatever form they like, but I do not want academics to crawl all over Freud and um, categorize him uh, inaccurately. Mm. And, and, and this was very honest with himself, really. Um, and, and funny, I think, I hope it comes across as funny sometimes. It, it comes across as funny, I think, if you've heard Freud interviewed before. I mean, I certainly found all the quotes quite funny, thinking of them in his yeah. almost like sing song kind of cadence, but it's um yeah i think i think yeah i think it really helps to know what the man sounds like and then you read all those quotes it makes it even more gripping i think well it also and and it was meant to be a corrective and uh, and bloomsbury the publishers i i, I went with them after uh, i was a bit of a bidding war for the for this book um because alexandra pringle um left me alone for four years one lunch i think there was and then she read she read it on a beach, most of it, and she, without a murmur, said, oh, it's okay, two volumes, if you like, and two volumes is not good publishing, but, well, it's just, it's good publishing, I think, um, but... Good, good publishing um, in what sense? Good publishing in, the, in that um, it's it's not probably the most profitable thing to do, there's, there's other ways of marketing, um, and I wanted, I wanted it to be, it to be a book that, like a plum pudding, one sort of dips into and comes out of, um, not someone I'm reading this at a <laughs> single session. That's, that would be a nightmare. And, but I wanted it to be readable and um, alive. And I, I wanted it to be the sort of book that Lucy would have enjoyed um, and relished. Not not because of him, but because of, of its account of an artist's life. Um, well, I know, I mean, flattery is always embarrassing, but, and I've only read the first volume, but it does sort of seem like the equal of Richardson's biographies of Picasso it's that sort of monumental in-depth gets into the detail of the man's life really well yes well see John was the trouble with John was that he bloody well went and died um mm. before the most interesting volume was written um I think that the years in which he knew him and and the appalling monster Douglas Cooper uh, and 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 um Picasso snubbing Douglas Cooper at every possible opportunity he ever got and all this sort of stuff would have gone into a final volume. 
and it's, it's very sad that it's, it, it won't appear. Is, is anything um, happening? Is anything happening with the? Uh, manuscript of the final volume by Richardson? Is it, is, it, is it going to be published in any form at all or no? I think it's, it's very much under wraps and I think it's not, I think it's not complete uh, at all. But, but there's, I think there's one more chunk which, which should be okay, um, but not, not the final, I think. Um, which, is, which is such a shame. I mean, uh, that, um, that's... Uh, I, John Richardson's favorite, my favorite book is the one that, that called The Devil and the Something um, is about Douglas Cooper. I think it's very extremely funny and very precise and terse. But I'm so glad that there are the three volumes so far. Um, Had you always wanted to be a writer? And what passion came first for you, painting or writing or both? To get me out of school teaching, I think it was the main. School I, out I, of school teaching? Yeah, I... I, I um, Wanted to, I, I, I wanted to um, escape from um, a classroom and so on. I, I liked it at the time, but, but it, I was actually desperate to stop and and I managed to get a decent life out of um, writing. How hard was um, that for you at the start of your career? I mean, how hard is it to, uh, in in a financial sense, how hard is it to make it as a writer at the start of your career? Well, it's nepotism, really, in a, in a way. I, I um, had, first of all, I, I was hired to write write book reviews when I left Oxford um, for, for no payment, but just to get the book free for the Northern Echo, which happened to be edited by a man called Harry Evans, who became the editor of the Sunday Times, legendary, important, great editor. That helped. Um, I belonged to a babysitting group, which also included the poet Tony Harrison. And he without telling me to show him some of my drawings to Alan Ross, editor of the London Magazine, which is the leading literary magazine at, the, at that stage. And, and I went down to London to discuss these drawings. And um, the poet Hugo Williams, who worked for the London Magazine, asked me whether I was interested in doing any writing. Had I done any writing? I lied and said I had written. So I started writing for the London Magazine, which is the top end of the literary market, attracted editors. And so before I knew where I was, I was writing, I was the art critic on Vogue, the Financial Times and the Sunday Times. And then I dumped all of them and went into the Observer um, and was there for 25 years. So th things developed from accident, from knowing somebody, Harry Evans, um, and um, knowing Ter belonging to that babysitting group, which meant that Tony um, very kindly set me going. So it's almost accidental. And um, do they feed um, off each other, your painting and your they, they writing? They fed off each other, and 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 it has to be said there was more of a living for art critics in those days, as in the seventies, eighties, um, than there is now. I mean, why is there why is there less of a living for art critics today? As newspaper readerships have disappeared, haven't they, more or less? And it's online. Um, my friend Sebastian Smee has done very well from um, writing Australia, then in London. He was in the he he was in the documentary of Painted Life, wasn't he? Yes, he was, and yeah. uh, and and um, again he became friendly with Lucian because Lucian admired something he'd written. Um, Where's he from in Australia? He's from he's from Sydney, I think. Basically, um, we did a, I did a show with in 1992 at the Gallery of New South Wales. Um, which wasn't all that much noticed at the time, but it was noticed by Se young Sebastian and a few others. And it was a very beautiful exhibition. Um, and so he, so, and Sebastian went on and won the Pulitzer Prize um, a few years ago, working, working with the Boston Globe. But then those sort of newspaper jobs have, have virtually disappeared, you, you may have noticed, um, mm. certainly in England. Um, so I don't think there's... A living to be made as it, as it was in but then again in my time there's probably only about half a dozen people making a living out of being art critics mm. uh, robert hughes of course but what do you um, think of robert hughes oh he's great i thought <laughs> idiotic in his, in his likes and dislikes i thought mm. but then why not and um yeah i think it's healthy to have that kind of attitude and 
art and I don't think there's enough of it that sort of um Yes, he breathes through life with it and he wore literally wore a cloak at times and has loved, mm. loved showing off and, and I like that. And, uh, uh, he's and he's very good and he's very su supportive and um, genial. Mm. And, and, and I've always loved his kind of cut the crap approach to art and he's, yes. you know, his belief that there is good and bad art, which is... Uh, which is a, a reasonable belief, isn't it? <laughs> but, a, but a rare belief these days, I think. Yes. <laughs> right, well... I think we can uh, wrap this conversation up and right um, thanks so much for coming on, William. As I said, uh, pleasure to occupy my morning quite happily. <laughs> no, great. No, but all your, um, you know, the artists you write about and the artists you're friends with are all um, heroes of mine and I absolutely loved your book. So this has been one of the more exciting podcasts I've got to, got to do. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.